I am delighted to welcome you all to this panel discussion on green central banks. Are they leaders or laggards in the climate challenge? Um, this is an event organized by Positive Money. Uh, for those of you who may be less familiar, Positive Money are a research and campaign organization working towards a money and banking system that enables a fair, sustainable and democratic economy. And uh, central banks and financial supervisors are of course important institutions within the financial system. They are tasked with ensuring price and financial stability and many central banks around the world also have many much broader responsibilities than that. And the disruptive effects of climate change will inevitably uh, affect their abilities to deliver on those mandates. So within this, in this webinar today, we will begin by presenting Positive Money's new report, the Green Central Banking Scorecard, to learn if the world's most systemically important central banks are actually stepping up to the climate challenge. And then we will move on to a, a panel discussion and an audience Q&A. And I'm very excited to say that we are joined by an international panel of high level experts from green finance who will share their thoughts on key developments in green central banking and also on next steps in, in the run up to this year's COP26 climate conference. Um, lots, of course, has been happening in the central banking space in recent months. So I'm really looking forward, as I'm sure all of you are too, to a lively debate on these issues. So to start off, I'm going to introduce our panelists and speakers for today. Um, firstly, we have Dunai Kirakapulu, who is Chief Economist and Director of Research at the Official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum, also known as OMSIS, which is an independent economic think tank. Dunai also chairs OMSIS Sustainable Policy Institute, and her expertise lies in the economic and strategic issues facing global public policy and, in, and investment institutions such as central banks, sovereign funds, and public pension funds. Next, we have Professor Yao Wang, who is the Director General of the International Institute of Green Finance at the Central University of Finance and Economics in Beijing. Uh, she is also holds multiple other influential titles, including Deputy Secretary General of the Green Finance Committee of the China Society for Finance and Banking, and also Secretary General of the Green Securities Committee of the Securities Association for China. We also have Lucie Pinson, who is the founder and executive director of Reclaim Finance, a French NGO and think tank working to create a financial system that supports the transition to sustainable societies. Lucie was the 2020 winner of the uh, influential Goldman Environmental Prize for Europe in recognition of her environmental activism that resulted in some of France's largest banks and insurers ending their financing of coal, which is hugely inspiring. And last, but by no means least, we have uh, David Barnes, who is an economist at Positive Money UK. He leads Positive Money's research on wellbeing, economics, sustainable finance, and green central banking. And he also works closely with the Climate Safe Lending Network. And David is the lead author of the Green Central Banking School Card, which he will present for us today. But before I hand over to David, just some, some quick housekeeping points from me. Um, this event is being recorded and it's also being streamed on Facebook Live. Um, I encourage you to ask questions throughout. Uh, we have the Q&A feature enabled on Zoom and you can also submit questions on Facebook Live and we'll get round to those in our audience Q&A section uh, later on in this event. So without further ado, I will hand over to David to present the Green Central Banking School Card. Over to you. Thanks so much, Katie, for sharing this event and thank you to the panelists for joining us in this discussion. Um, the report that Positive Money published this morning finds that central banks in the world's biggest economies, the so-called G20, are failing to play their part in tackling climate and ecological breakdown. We argue that central banks must speed up concrete policy action to align the financial system with environmental objectives. I'll first outline why central banks should go green 
then I'll explain what a green central bank would actually look like. And I'll end with an overview of how G20 countries performed in our green central banking scorecard. In order to address the daunting challenge of climate and ecological breakdown, we will have to undertake a major transformation of our economies. Fiscal, industrial, and environmental authorities have to be in the driving seat on this journey. Uh, but as the guardians of the financial system, central banks and financial supervisors also have a key role to play. Within their current mandate, central banks have a duty to bring the environment into policymaking for at least two reasons. First, many central banks have a mandate to support government objectives, which almost always include environmental objectives. Secondly, central banks have core mandates of price and often financial stability. And to put it simply, it will be impossible for central banks to fulfill these mandates uh, in a world of ecological collapse and runaway climate change. And the COVID-19 pandemic strengthens these arguments. Uh, rising temperatures and environmental degradation significantly increase the risk of pandemics. So if we fail to tackle these challenges, we're far more likely to see further pandemics down the line. So the COVID crisis should really serve as a wake up call to central banks of the urgency uh, of fostering an environmentally sustainable financial system. So what would an ideal green central bank look like? Well, we review proposals and initiatives across four areas. Firstly, research and advocacy. Uh, a lot is already happening on this front. The network for greening the financial system is the key forum where 89 central banks and supervisors are sharing best practices and collaborating on environment related research. A lot of great work is coming out of this network. And of course, central banks are also publishing their own research reports and increasingly giving many speeches about climate related financial risks and green finance. Uh, this flurry of research and discussion is something that is relatively recent and shows that these issues are climbing up the agenda. The second area we look at is monetary policy, which aims to keep inflation low and stable uh, by influencing financial markets. Monetary policy is a responsibility of all central banks, and there are many tools that could be adapted and introduced to effectively green monetary policy. Uh, for example, central banks could stop purchasing corporate bonds from big polluters. Um, they could in multiple ways change the terms on which they lend to financial institutions, and they could even go further, for example, by supporting green fiscal spending. I'm just realizing that I'm not sure if the audience can actually see me. Um, it might still, it, the video might still be on Katie. So I'll just ask Shupakai if it's possible to adjust that. On the other hand, also perfectly happy for, for the camera to, to, to stay on Katie. Um, but uh, yeah, that might be a small technical glitch. Oh, everyone should be on screen right now. Okay, great, great. Um, so the third area is financial policy, um, which involves the regulation of financial institutions to ensure the stability of the system. Uh, this is often referred to as prudential policy. Um, many central banks have a financial stability mandate, but in some cases it's the responsibility of separate financial supervisors. Uh, so the report takes these institutions into account as well. Uh, the financial policies that can be greened mostly relate to the financial risks of climate and ecological breakdown. For example, central banks and supervisors could require that banks hold more capital against exposures to high carbon assets. Uh, this would protect banks from defaults of high carbon loans as the transition to a sustainable economy occurs. And it would also incentivize a shift away from these assets in the first place. Um, and the fourth and final area to look at is what we refer to as leading by example, which encompasses further green initiatives that central bankers should undertake to demonstrate that they are greening their own institutions, 
uh, beyond their monetary and financial policy responsibilities. If central bankers take environmental risks and sustainable finance seriously, they, they really must show leadership in disclosing their own environmental risks, uh, greening their non-policy portfolios, supporting green initiatives and standard making processes, and embedding sustainability principles across their own institutions. Now, the novel contribution of Positive Money's report is that we have evaluated and ranked G20 countries based on the green policies of their central banks and supervisors. Uh, to do that, we developed a scoring system and gathered all the relevant data on the green policies and initiatives of G20 monetary and financial authorities. This process involved an extensive literature review, consultation with civil society and academic experts, as well as engagement with central bankers and supervisors. Uh, overall, the results, which you can see on page five of the report, are fairly bleak. The highest score in the ranking is a mere 50 out of 130. Uh, although central banks and supervisors from 14 countries scored full marks on research and advocacy, they performed very poorly across the other three categories of monetary policy, financial policy, and leading by example. Fossil fuel production must fall by roughly 6% per year to meet climate targets, but there's a complete absence of monetary or financial policies aimed at significantly discouraging or restricting fossil fuel investments in the G20. To the extent that central banks and supervisors are taking any concrete action on climate, it's focused on disclosures, stress testing, risk management, and in rare cases, uh, green incentives, none of which will be sufficient to align financial flows with the 1.5 degree world. But there is some emerging leadership in China, which ranks in first place, the People's Bank of China and the insurance and banking regulator have shown a willingness to actively steer financial markets in a sustainable direction. In Brazil, which sits in second place in the ranking, the central bank recently announced a new sustainability agenda, which includes commitments to a green liquidity facility and a green bureau for rural credit. Meanwhile, in France, which takes the third spot in the ranking, the French central bank recently published stronger criteria for the exclusion of fossil fuel investments in its own portfolios. Uh, all these institutions still have a very long way to go, but they're definitely heading in the right direction. So as Katie alluded to, this year is a crucial year for climate as the COP26 conference approaches in November. Uh, we absolutely need fiscal authorities to really step up, but we also need central banks to show greater ambition. They need to move beyond the rhetoric and towards action. And at Positive Money, we look forward to further collaborating with partners on this topic, engaging with central banks and financial supervisors, and of course, keeping score of any green developments in future editions of the Green Central Banking Scorecard. That's all from me. Thanks, Katie. Thank you very much, David, for that excellent overview of what is a fascinating report, and I urge you all to read it if you haven't already done so. Um, I'm going to hand over to our panellists now to um, hear their reactions on the report, and I'll be particularly interested to hear their thoughts on whether they think central banks and supervisors are doing enough to incorporate environmental considerations into their policy making. So I'll hand over to Danai to start with. Thanks, Katie. Very pleased to be here. Thanks, David, for inviting me and well done on the launch of your report. I'll start with the first question, uh, which is the why. And um, I was interested to see that uh, David presented two reasons in his opening remarks, and he presented as the first one, the kind of uh, need to align with government policy. And that is part of uh, how central banks, uh, that is part of some central banks mandate. And as a second reason he presented the impacts that climate change will have on their price and financial stability mandates. And I found the order interesting because I think most central banks have so far viewed the motivation to address climate risk primarily through the, the, the second lens in, in David's remarks, which is how does this affect 
price uh, stability and financial stability. And it's been mostly through this risk lens. And I think it's important to, to think about the why, because I think this also affects the actions they have taken on climate change. So most central banks have seen this as climate change affects inflation, affects financial stability, has the potential to turn into systemic risk. That's why we have uh, a, a role to play here. And people often say, well, if climate change affects these, these variables, and there are so many other uh, indicators that also affect inflation, the economy that are not traditionally within the, the central banking area of activity, why climate change? And I think it's important to understand why climate change is really unique in that sense, because it's irreversible, it's existential. We cannot say that because central banks are now starting to address climate change, they will start addressing everything else, because in the economy, there's so many things that affect what central banks are doing. Um, to define themselves with what governments is doing, I think that matters very much because that's the next frontier of central banks understanding what they should do. And you can draw very different lessons uh, in terms of how to address climate risk or how to act on climate change if your motivation is to protect from the risks and to look at how it affects your inflation and financial stability mandates versus feeling and, and, and thinking that you are actively part of, of contributing and supporting the transition efforts of government. So moving then to the second question of the report, which is what a green central bank looks like. I think we've come a long way in understanding this. Um, and there are the, the various hats that central banks have. There's the monetary policy, the financial stability and prudential policies, and also their own activities in terms of managing uh, portfolios, be that their uh, monetary policy portfolios or their reserves management or their pensions portfolios. And I think there we are now in that discussion of the how, what are the different policies that central banks can tweak in each of these areas. Uh, and the report that the Network for Greening the Financial System published last week, I think does a great job in terms of um, exploring what are the different actions that central banks can take in that. And I think it's important at this point to say how some of these approaches may differ depending on what the ultimate goal is. If you're looking to protect um, the central bank from the risks, you may take different action on climate change compared to if your goal is to align yourself with, a, uh, with a, the efforts towards a, trans or a, net, a transition to net zero, for example. So one example, which is in portfolio management, if you want to just protect your portfolios from climate risks, you are more likely to take a negative screening uh, approach, for example, ensure that there are no carbon intensive industries in your portfolios. And some central banks buy equities, some central banks have corporate bonds in their monetary policy portfolios, for example, it's not something that applies to all, but let's say, let's take the asset management slide as an example. Um, but is this the most effective approach if, you, if your goal is to support the transition? Maybe not. Maybe a more effective approach is to actually engage with the companies that you have in your portfolios. And again, not all central banks will be able to do that um, and steer them in a, more, um, in, in a more sustainable direction and support them in transitioning. So instead of removing the risk entirely from your portfolio, you engage with them. So here we see how understanding the different reason why central banks uh, and may, may want to address climate change in their operations may lead to different actions. And again, I think the NGFS report that was published last week does a very good job at highlighting some of these conflicts and how in, in this report, for example, with the scorecard, you give different points uh, for different actions that central banks can take. I think it's also important to think how do some of these options that you have on the scorecard interact with each other. I think that may be a next step in our thinking of assessing central banks. Um, and then the third question, which is the how green are our G20 central banks, which is also the kind of how quickly are we moving the, the when question, are we moving in a, we're moving in the right direction, but are we moving fast enough? And I think that's now where the conversation is moving. And I think that's where we should be spending more of our time um, in this discussion and in discussions about central banks actions, because um, climate change is, uh, has a very short window of opportunity to solve. And uh, we are seeing that central banks are at the stage of 
having understood the direction, having uh, they score very well in the research and advocacy category of the scorecard, and you would expect it to be that way. You'd expect that to be the first step. It's logical to me as a, as a reader of the report that first you need to have the, the recognition and understanding, and then you, you move to the, to the actual imp implementation. And I think we also need to ask the question that if they're not green enough, why is that? And I think that's, that's something that would be interesting to talk about in the panel, because that helps us understand also what, how could they change and become greener if that's the objective. And there may be different answers to that question. One may be that some central banks uh, face internal pressures in their own institutions or in their own jurisdictions that they do not feel that they can move fast enough because we, we in this community, in this um, even the central bankers that we interact with from the NGFS are the ones within the central banks that work on climate issues, but they are much bigger institutions and you also have groups in their jurisdictions that are not necessarily understanding that this should be the direction. So I think that that is one thing to consider. The second, why are they not moving fast enough? Is there a hesitancy that their actions may cause inequalities or this discussion about not just thinking about a climate transition, but also a just and a fair transition? Is that something that is causing some hesitancy? Some people have suggested that may be a reason why central banks are not acting fast enough. And if so, should that also be something that central banks need to start thinking about, that their actions are not just supporting the climate transition, but a just and fair transition? Another answer to are central banks not green enough may be that they don't have the tools in place yet. Do we need to start thinking about how do we change their, um, their design, their, their toolkit, um, there is data is a big challenge. And I think, again, that was a very big uh, breakthrough for me reading the NGFS report last week, because it had a paragraph that said, uh, we shouldn't take the lack of data as an excuse not to act because the cost of not acting may actually be higher than the cost of acting with insufficient data. And I think that's a really important realization. And it goes back to the first point that climate change is irreversible, it's existential, and we have a short window of opportunity to solve it. And I think it's very encouraging that central banks are acknowledging this. So I'll stop here and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anai. Some excellent points there that really open up um, the debate on these issues. Um, Professor Yao Wang, I'll hand over to you now. Okay, thank you, Kate. Uh, yeah, central banks actually indeed play a crucial role in uh, building a, a green financial system. As we all know, it's in the face of climate risks, including both physical damages and tra tra uh, transitional risks. Uh, price stability might be harder to achieve. Therefore, central banks need to uh, address uh, environmental and the climate change issue uh, because they directly affect monetary and financial stability. I think also we are thinking that after uh, pandemic and and, uh, and uh, uh, the crisis. So uh, uh, central banks maybe should also have the uh, trouble to how to uh, integrate uh, in environment and climate risks and uh, also to uh, uh, address the uh, crisis. So I'm happy to see that China was ranked first among other G20 countries in the report. On the one hand, I think China has one of the most comprehensive green finance frameworks uh, globally. And uh, the construction of the green finance uh, system started as early as 1995. However, the green financial system is still relatively early and scoring 50 points out of 130 uh, possible says that this is still much space for improvement. Of course, I think that now um, in the recent years, China also improved, uh, especially in the uh, leading example, such as uh, China already uh, to uh, uh, support the uh, taxonomy standards and also uh, educating. Uh, so uh, I think later, uh, maybe uh, uh, G20 other countries also will improve their scores. Uh, I think how, how have the central banks and the supervisors they uh, address the climate and other factors in uh, other factors, especially 
after the crisis so far. I think what I see that most central banks and the supervisors, they are focusing on the uh, uh, traditional crisis response, particularly for small and medium-sized enterprises and for employment. Uh, for example, in China, you know, the central banks paid particularly attention to uh, targeted support for small and micro enterprises, uh, taking out more than one trillion RMB re refinancing and and rediscount for them. So I personally believe that these central banks measures are in line with the uh, UN sustain, uh, SDG goals. As for the consideration of uh, climate and environmental related factors during uh, 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 during uh, after the uh, the crisis, I think it appears that most central banks in most countries haven't yet take uh, uh, taken substantial actions. This is also can show in the report. The reason I think is that historically. Climate change and environmental factors haven't been a part of central bank's policy framework. However, this give, gives the main significance of the report uh, we discussed today. So as many of you may know, the Green Swarm report uh, issued by the BIS uh, last year and made the new swarm of climate risks widely acknowledged. Then my response to the second question is, I think it is about the strengths, weakness, gaps, and po potentials. So in, in terms of uh, policy practice, I think that all of the policy tools presented in the report are possible, uh, are, are possible options. However, in considering the uh, context of the ongoing uh, the uh, pandemic and the possible uh, and 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 the uh, recovery, green recovery, and take into account uh, specific characteristics of uh, of policies. Um, my opinion is that the application of the uh, the green financial policy should be uh, uh, se se sequential. So this is my uh, my uh, in fact my view on the next step of central banks. This is also the core point I want to address in, in my speaking. Uh, I, I think to. To be specific, first, it is important to prepare for the implementation of green, green regulation. This is mainly to identify the greenness of projects by taxonomy. Uh, you know, uh, 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 this is have been developed well in Europe and uh, China. And second, uh, with the ability to identify, central banks should uh, prioritize uh, 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 the inclusion of green factors into policies already in place. For example, uh, in the collateral framework, the uh, acceptiness of green assets should be clarified and in the assets purchase programs uh, and the brown assets should be excluded, green assets should be uh, uh, prioritized. So in re uh, refinancing policies, targeted support for green business should be uh, compliant. You know, uh, in China, when last year, when our uh, president uh, uh, declared our carbon neutrality goal, uh, and also People's Bank of China also uh, uh, declared uh, 10 important works in 2021, uh, uh, the, the, the third uh, important work of the PPOC this year is about to how to uh, use uh, green, how to issue green finance to support uh, to uh, support green uh, uh, to support uh, emission uh, reducing. So uh, in, uh, this year we will very soon we will have some uh, green uh, monetary policy we will issue. Uh, and I think this is also a, a step uh, for, for uh, in China uh, to uh, central banks will well done. And third, I think uh, some entire, entirely new policies that require extensive capacity building can be uh, capacity building and uh, maybe first uh, uh, piloted, piloted first and then gradually roll out later. Uh, for example, long term prudential tools such as uh, climate stress tests require both the development of new methodologies and widely accepted scenarios, uh, which may involve a lot of effort from regulators. 
uh, it can be uh, phrased in gradually instead of rushing into a full scale. Uh, uh, full, full scale. Uh, for example, in China, uh, uh, PBOC already uh, suggested and uh, our six uh, green finance, national green financial pilots, now they are doing uh, green uh, 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 environmental di uh, information disclosure uh, of uh, financial institutions. And then later maybe uh, uh, all the financial institutions will disclose their environmental information and, uh, and also environmental stress testing. Now some pilots and, uh, and uh, uh, pioneer uh, banks and as asset managing companies, now they are working on their climate stress testing. So I think this is a step can step by step and improve the capacity uh, is very important. And fourth, I, I, I think it should be, be noted that some short term policies for safeguarding liquidity, such as standing uh, lending facilities may be not appropriate, uh, appropriate for supporting the green transition. So the reason on, on the one hand is that these policies need to fulfill their uh, basic function of safeguarding the financial stability in the short term, uh, which should not be uh, distracted. On the other hand, green transition is a long term structure uh, goal and, the, and the short term policies uh, naturally lack the ability to provide long term support. I think, okay, I, I, I will stop here and uh, I'm uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wang. That was really interesting. Um, I agree with you. Um, China and Brazil, um, it's very striking that they have done so much more on their green policies and far earlier than um, um, Western economy central banks have done. Um, definitely um, action being taken since the 1990s and far before Mark Carney began speaking about these issues in Europe in, in 2015. Um, I'll hand over now to uh, Lucy for her thoughts on the report. Hi, thank you, Kelly, and thanks everyone and Positive Money for inviting me. And indeed, you made a perfect transition um, to my speech, Katie, because I was uh, starting remembering, um, all of us, we do remember Mark Carney's speech given in 2015 in front of the insurers at Lloyd's of London about breaking the tragedy of the horizon. And at that time, Mike Carney was the governor of the Bank of England. And all of us also remember Chris in Lagarde's post to put climate change on the ECB's agenda. But where is the follow through? The environmental and public health disasters that is COVID-19 should have been a wake up call for central banks to urgently integrate climate into their operations. But while these institutions embark on titanic responses to the crisis, notably through a massive program of asset purchases, they seem to have all skipped the sustainability question. The ECB alone plans to buy an historical 1.97 trillion euros worth of assets between 2020 and 2022 without any social and environmental conditions. Yet, we should remind ourselves, polluting companies are the first beneficiaries of these operations. About 63% of the ECB asset purchases and 53% of its collateral list are made up of carbon intensive companies. Diving into the details reveals the astonishing scale of the issue. Let's have a look at the scorecard and at what it means concretely for the energy sector. Beyond research, advocacy, and transparency, the only measures taken by some central banks on monetary policy have been about encouraging focus on green assets. In other words, it means that even when they do acknowledge that there is a risk, climate change, and that they need to act to mitigate this risk, central banks have been resolutely ignoring the need to phase out fossil fuels. This is a clear failure to do what is necessary. The central bank's leader all know about the production gap report coordinated by UNEP, which shows that we won't keep global warming to 1.5 and prevent the resulting financial instability if we don't reduce by 6% the production of coal, oil, and gas every year till 2030. This means starting right now, not tomorrow or even less in three to four years. 
The countries of the G20 have been calling for an end to subsidies to fossil fuels since the summit in 2009, but at the same time, not one of the central bank or regulator has adopted the measures to make sure that monetary and prudential policies do not support the development of new fossil fuel projects and account for the risk they generate. A case in point, the ECB still buy bonds from 37 fossil fuel companies including Shell and Total, which are planning at least 67 new oil and gas projects. As a first conclusion, we can say all bark and no bite. The maximum score is only 37% and it belongs to the Chinese central banks. European central banks rank from the third to seven positions behind China and Brazil two countries where climate has not been as high as a priority, and two banks that have not been as vocal on the issue. The gap between words and deeds is clear for the ECB, but also for the French central banks. French saves its face thanks to its new fossil fuel investment policy and its proposition to green the ECB, but its score remains shockingly low and all with the image of a climate leader it paints itself as embodying. The second le lesson of this scorecard is that action is both possible and necessary now. The ECB and other EU banks often hide behind the lack of knowledge to avoid acting, but the Chinese and Brazilian counterparts did not wait to implement first measures on monetary policy, something French governor Villoy de Gallo said would take three to five years for the ECB. The NGFS report published last week underlines indeed that waiting could be very, a very dangerous gamble for central banks and regulators. It also states that they are fully able to act now using the metrics that they already have, namely non-financial metrics such as, for example, a list of coal companies to mitigate climate change. The position taken by those who have used that more data is needed is also highly worrying when you consider the growing body of research, including from the ECB itself, which shows that delaying action severely aggravates climate risk and that climate mitigation falls within the price stability mandate. This is especially surprising given that, and, and I'm almost quoting ECB board member Frank Anderson verbatim here, the ECB secondary mandate is mandatory. The ECB is supposed to support EU objectives among which one can find the fight against climate change and the target of achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. So is change underway? It's worth noting that the Bank of England already indicated it will decarbonize before the Glasgow conference its asset purchases. And if all goes well, the Bank of England could swiftly set an example for EU central banks to follow. Governor Klasnot from the Dutch central banks also acknowledged yesterday that there is a risk that asset purchases are skewed toward fossil intensive assets and suggesting shifting them to correct it. Now is the time to act. The COP26 loom lets this scorecard serve as a wake up call for central banks. It's time to get serious on climate. Thank you very much, Lucy. Uh, David, I wondered if you had any responses to any of our panelists comments on the report there. Sure, thanks so much, Katie. And, and thanks uh, to all the speakers for, for your insightful contributions. I'll, I'll pick up on a few points um, that, that stood out for me. I think, first of all, um, I was really pleased to hear that I mentioned the recent NGFS report released uh, last week and specifically the line um, that we, we shouldn't take the lack of data as a reason to not act. I think that's that represents a, a significant shift in my mind um, in the central banking community. I think not long ago at all, the lack of data and uh, lack of adequate methodologies and lack of taxonomy, these were all sort of, I think, primary um, excuses that, that were often uh, brought out to explain uh, a delay in action. And so I think that statement is, is quite powerful coming from the NGFS. And I think we would, we would love to see at Positive Money central banks embrace a precautionary approach, which uh, which was developed by 
by uh, yourself, Katie, and your colleagues at, at UCLI IPP and the New Economics Foundation. Um, and, and a precautionary approach, I think, is the responsible way to, to deal with an existential threat like climate change and ecological breakdown and to deal with the, the radical uncertainty that, that it presents. Um, and then just another, another quick point on, on Danai's remarks uh, regarding why central banks may not be doing enough. Um, I think, I think Danai raised a number of, of really interesting points there. And um, in particular, there, there's this one on, on a potential hesitancy of um, potentially exacerbating inequality in taking action. So a concern about ensuring a just transition and, and if that is something that, that central banks are thinking about, then, then I think that's, that's actually a great thing. And I think um, central banks should definitely be, be thinking about that um, as well as the climate and ecological issues. I think these are all fundamentally interlinked. And so, yeah, my, my short answer to would cent should central banks start thinking about inequality would be yes, they should. And, I, and that might be something that we can we can discuss a bit more later. Um, then coming to Professor Yao Wang's remarks, I, I, there was uh, I, another two things there that I, I think were, were particularly interesting for me. First of all, um, the, the mention of the Green Swan Report by the BIS and the French Central Bank. I think this is another really important report from the central banking community. I think it's probably um, the, the most sort of comprehensive and, and I think uh, um, paradigm shifting report that we've seen from the central banking community. And I see there's already been a question from the audience on that. Um, and yeah, I, I think this report does very much uh, open the door to a precautionary approach. And um, so I, I would very much recommend that piece of work. Um, I think it still falls a bit short on the recommendations um, but the, the theoretical position is very strong. Um, and then another remark from Yao Wang regarding taxonomies. I think uh, I just want to express just a little bit of concern here because while I think taxonomies are incredibly important, um, we do have a bit of a concern at Positive Money that current taxonomy efforts could end up potentially legitimizing rather than solving greenwashing issues. Um, so. I think there, there's a lot to be discussed on that point. And, and again, maybe that's something we can come back to in the discussion if there's interest. Um, and coming to, to Lucy's really powerful remarks, um, I, you know, she mentioned that central banks and supervisors have, have all skipped the environmental question in their response to the COVID crisis. Um, and I think this is a really important point uh, an Inspire report found that less than 1% of central banks and supervisors tied their COVID response to uh, sustainability measures. And given the really close interconnection between uh, climate and ecological issues and COVID-19 and more generally increased risk of pandemics, I think that's, it's very counterproductive to sideline climate and, and ecology in the response to a pandemic. Um, so I think, I think that was a, a very important point there. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there and, and yeah, looking forward to, to continuing this, this discussion. Thank you very much, David. I've just got a, a quick question for you to start off our, our panel discussion then. Um, coming back to the, the UK uh, situation, um, the Bank of England obviously came fourth in the ranking. Um, some people might have expected it to maybe perform slightly higher. Uh, the UK likes to position itself as a leader in green finance. And obviously the Bank of England has just had its mandate updated um, to reflect green considerations. So is the Bank of England going to be one to watch this year? Yes, I, I think so. Um, and you're absolutely right. The Bank of England is often seen as a green leader. Uh, given how vocal former Governor Mark Carney was on this issue. Um, but beyond climate-related disclosures and, and the climate stress test, there hasn't been very much by way of concrete action at the bank so far. Uh, but I do think this is likely to change in the coming months. 
Um, as you mentioned, the government recently updated the bank's monetary and financial remits to reflect environmental sustainability and the net zero target. And in response to this, the bank has reaffirmed that it will decarbonize its corporate bond purchase scheme and is considering climate related changes to its collateral framework, which determines the conditions on which uh, central banks lend to financial institutions. I think these will be really important developments and, and we hope at cost of money that the Bank of England implements them in a sufficiently ambitious manner and also then goes further with financial measures such as adjustments to capital requirements to better reflect the high risk of carbon intensive exposures. And of course, given that the UK is hosting both the G7 and the COP26 uh, climate conference this year, I think we can expect to see some leadership from the Bank of England. So yes, def definitely one to watch this year. That's great to hear. And I've got a question now for, for Danai. Um, in your comments, you, you made the very good distinction between, on the one hand, uh, central, some central banks preferring a risk-based approach where they kind of prioritise protecting um, climate risks on their own balance sheet operations. And on the other hand, this idea of policy alignment where central banks could alternatively explore ways that their op operations actively support the transition or, or at the very least don't undermine uh, government transition policy. Um, now, when, in, within the Western context, many central banks are actually not particularly com comfortable with implementing these sort of proactive um, interventionist policies, which uh, positive monies report advocates. Uh, they prefer instead this kind of market led approach. Um, kind of focusing on, on fixing market failures through disclosure and, and risk modeling approaches such as scenario analysis. And I, I wanted to ask, because I know that OMTIF have surveyed global central banks on these issues. From the insights of your work, what is the source of discomfort for more interventionist policies in particular? And what sort of prerequisites would be needed for central banks to, to be more comfortable using their market signaling, their supervisory and their regulatory toolkits? to implement these sorts of policies. Thank you. I think we can differentiate between, as you said, proactive and protective uh, kinds of policies. That's what the NGFS calls them. We've called them in our report market fixing versus, versus market shaping. But even the NGFS acknowledges that their report kind of puts out the different actions that central banks can take in each of these categories and which uh, measures they can take uh, under both of these options depends on the central bank itself. So the NGFS, of course, is a network of many central banks, almost 90, and each of them will have a different uh, mandate. It will have a different uh, circumstances in which it operates. So I don't think it's a matter of preferences. I think it's a matter of how advanced their thinking is, how advanced their, um, their abilities are to put them into practice. And going back to my, uh, why are they not green enough question? I think also we should understand that as researchers, as uh, analysts, as, as central bank watchers, we of course will want to have a more comprehensive um, assessment of what central banks could be doing, but from the practical side, of the central banks themselves and you introduce also as a think tank we're also a membership organization and central banks are a lot of our members and working with them and we are a stakeholder member on the ngfs as well having the kind of practical limitations of how do you balance how much you can do uh, because if you go too far does that then mean that you have to scale back too much because you you get a lot of pushback so yes we want to be ambitious but but will this actually lead to the outcome we want to have? And I think that's an important distinction to draw. And, and to bring up the Bank of England as an example as well, because you asked that question before, I think the move that we saw from the Treasury updating the remit of the Bank of England is an important action in that direction, because it, will, it does not actually really change how the Bank of England considers itself, because I think the Bank of England already operated with that as its guiding principles or an assumption, but it validates what the Bank of England does. And I think that's important. So your question of whether this would be a game changer, yes, maybe, but I don't think it actually changes the way the Bank of England thinks. I think for me, the most important thing the Bank of England did was the disclosure report that they, that they put out uh, because it's not just the report that they put out, it's also the whole process of understanding to disclose the risks themselves 
how they can then work with the private sector and the institution they supervise, what are the challenges that they face that others may face. And I think that that is the kind of leading by example part as well. If I had to choose a central bank to watch for the coming year, it would actually be the Federal Reserve, because that's where we've really seen a big shift in direction and in thinking. And I think that will also be an interesting one to watch in the distinction of the question you asked me about the kind of market shaping versus market fixing, where we may see very different approaches to how the US government versus the EU approach the whole issue around taxonomies. Uh, we tell you what a sustainable world looks like and you tell us how you kind of reach that versus the disclosures and kind of you look at your, at your activities, you disclose the risks, which is a more kind of um, uh, market-led approach. So I think that will be an interesting one to watch. And of course, central banks may reflect that as well. That's some very interesting points. And I agree with you that the Federal Reserve is definitely one to watch this year. And perhaps we can get onto that later later in the uh, questions. And um, this sort of leads on to my, to my next question, perhaps for Professor Yao Wang. Um, to what extent is coordination with other government departments necessary to implement some of these policies? Um, coming back to the example of the Bank of England, it was quite interesting to note uh, an FT article that came out a couple of weeks ago that reported that the, the Bank of England staff are actually very active in, in internally lobbying for their own mandate change um, to, to Her Majesty's Treasury, to the UK Treasury. And from the Chinese context, of course, um, China, her, the People's Bank of China has been much more proactive in taking these kind of market shaping um, policies, perhaps due to, because they have institutionally much more coordination with other government departments. So, Professor Yao, Yao Wang, what, what, what were your thoughts on this perspective? Thank you uh, for the question. I think uh, in China, uh, you know, for the green, uh, China have already have a top-down uh, green financial framework, uh, except uh, uh, especially from 2016. Uh, you know, uh, except the PBOC, other uh, financial regulators, CSRC, CBRC, uh, CBIRC, and also Ministry of Finance uh, and the National uh, Development, uh, uh, a National NDRC is a, is a national development uh, uh, and the reform commission uh, the, uh, and the and ministry of e environment uh, uh, ministry of uh, ecological and the environment these uh, six uh, ministries actually working together to uh, issue the uh, guideline for establishing green financial uh, system so i think uh, from the first step uh, china's uh, uh, ministries uh, governments are are uh, already sitting together to uh, push green finance uh, uh, together. So um, for example, uh, uh, for the NDRC, they are responsible for a uh, green taxonomy. It's a green industry catalog they already issued in 2019. And also um, Ministry of, uh, of uh, uh, MEE, they are responsible to uh, 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 give some uh, environmental information disclosures uh, 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 indicators and also working very closely with uh, uh, with um, uh, PBOC uh, to uh, push green finance, especially climate finance, and also uh, MEE also issued the uh, guideline on climate finance. So uh, I think, uh, of course, other other uh, governments they are also uh, want to use. Uh, green uh, green financial policies to support the uh, their industry transition. So now I think the problem uh, is that uh, we should have a common uh, common taxonomy. So now we have a green you know we have a green taxonomy in the uh, financial system, but also we have green ta taxonomy for the industry system. So I think this is a coordination need to be improved improved but ministry actually they're working together to to put and for the um uh for pboc i think you know uh, uh china and the uk are, are 
uh, always working together to push green finance. And they have uh, set up the tax, uh, tax force on green finance, uh, China UK tax, uh, green finance tax force. So I think they are uh, most, fo most focused on, uh, on, uh, 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 on the uh, climate and the environmental information disclosure. So for example, uh, 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 Bank of England, they they already encourage some uh, financial institutions to disclose in, uh, in, uh, information. Also in China, there are more uh, financial institutions. They, uh, they are disclosing their environmental inform information. This is very important. You know, the new G20 uh, Sustainable Finance uh, Study Group, they have uh, two main themes to to improve one is i think is uh, to uh, overcome the uh, the the information challenges so so that's uh, very important to disclose uh, environmental climate and environmental information and the second i think is uh, is to uh, improving capacity to do green investment so uh, now uh, uh, central banks uh, they are also in uh, encourage and also they will use the uh, green uh, green policy, green uh, monetary policy to leverage commercial banks uh, and also uh, to to do green loan and also to do ESG invest in investment. So I think they have a uh, uh, they have a uh, uh, already have some uh, some some. Uh, policies, regulations, incentives, and also incentives. And I think now we are lack of, uh, what we lack of is the, uh, just as David mentioned, we lack of the methodologies and the capacity to uh, clarify how much they faced the, uh, the climate risks. And now uh, PBOC already set up a big uh, research team to working on that. And also we are deeply involved in that as a, uh, also as a, uh, um, uh, as a entities also involved in this, in, in this uh, uh, research, research team. So we hope that we can have a more, um, uh, we can have a, have a good methodologies and, uh, and also um, to help more financial institutions to can clarify their climate risks. So this is a, also a important things. And to do the green investment, I think for for the uh, in China we uh, lack of the awareness, and also we lack of the examples to show to the uh, financial institutions that if they invest in green area, uh, maybe they can they can uh, have a a good re better return so i think uh, also they then for uh, for pboc and also for financial regulators maybe some uh, mechanisms some financing mechanisms green financing mechanisms is important uh, to um, uh, is, is important, uh, such as, uh, you know, China now, just as I mentioned, uh, PBOC are working on a green, uh, green, uh, poli uh, green monetary policy, structural green uh, monetary policy. Uh, the, the reason is that they hope that use this green, uh, green low, uh, re-lowing or green uh, re-discount, these policies can leverage commercial banks to can invest more uh, uh, can invest, uh, uh, can do more green investment. And uh, I, I actually, one, one word, I think that now uh, in China, especially in developing countries, maybe transition finance is also very important. You know, for in China, our, net, uh, our en uh, energy uh, structure, coal is the, the majority. So how to make this Brown asset to be greener is very is also very uh, important. Uh, so I think PBOC maybe can or should also thinking about how to support uh, transition finance. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lots of food for thought there. I want to um, hand over now to Lucy. Um, I wonder if you could um, talk to us a bit more on this question of taxonomies, which um, Professor Wang just mentioned. Um, the sustainable taxonomy in Europe has obviously been very uh, topical and politically contested. 
um, area. Um, some people believe it's, it's a prerequisite for some of these more market shaping policies that central banks should undertake. What are your views on the on, on taxonomies in general and how the European Commission needs to improve its current approaches? So you're on mute, it? I was on mute, sorry about that. Um, so thanks for the for the question, which is obviously like a hot topic right now as we speak, um, considering the taxonomy is under attack by some uh, several states uh, that are having an, um, a gentle here, would say, to some uh, lobbying lobbies from the industry. Um, we all know it's not a secret about uh, the French lobbying to push uh, the nuclear in the taxonomy and also the demands by some uh, companies, uh, supported by some countries countries to include uh, the gas sector and some gas plants into the taxonomy back in. Um, let's be clear, the taxonomy will be of no use uh, if both or gas and, and, and nuclear are including in, in this taxonomy. So obviously it's, it's too early to say, but uh, we hope uh, the commission uh, will uh, uh, not allow that to happen and then um, based on the fact like assuming there will be a, a proper taxonomy that could be of use uh, to drive the transition it's just a grammar and a, a workbook I would say so it's important to agree on what is green and what is not green um, but then there will be like what use will be allowed uh, thanks to the taxonomy and how central banks can use the taxonomy to drive uh, and adapt their monetary and prudential policies. And here, I think we are back to the first issue about is green and, and is uh, increasing the support to the green sector enough or not to shift uh, the energy sector towards the 1.5 targets. And, and the answer is clearly no. Up to now, we know adding a, a layer of green does not automatically lead uh, a reduction in the activities as a, in polluting sectors. And as Danae was saying, we have a very short window of opportunity to keep global warming at 1.5. And it will be really important to, um, if we want to shift the economy towards a, a, a no carbon economy, we will have to condition financial services, including uh, the monetary and prudential policy to a stop in the development of new fossil fuel assets. Um, so it will be important if the taxonomy, the green taxonomy, end up being a, a success story to also do a taxonomy on polluting activities in order to identify the activities in the sectors that we need to phase out fully or that we need to, dr uh, to drastically scale down if we want to keep global warming at 1.5. And in that case, it will help indeed um, maybe the central banks to adapt uh, the monetary and prudential policies um, accordingly. However, we know the political time is slower than the climate time and we can't wait for having the green taxonomy and maybe one day a taxonomy on polluting activities to act uh, considering especially the scale of the state's answer to the COVID crisis. So it's really important to right now uh, put some conditions to the asset purchases that are still ongoing at the ECB level. And here I would like to go back to something that we have been discussing already a lot of time. Um, even if central banks don't take like a proactive uh, stance on climate and don't act in order to mitigate their own impact on climate change, but do want to take a, pro, uh, a protective approach and make sure mm -hmm. that uh, the financial stability is maintained, even to do that, they will have to take a precautionary approach anyway. Uh, and we do have the data and needed to uh, to do it. And, and maybe some things that we haven't said is that the financial sectors might also teach a lesson to the central banks 
we have been we have seen uh, private banks and insurance companies and investors taking actions on the core sector, for example, but also growingly taking they are taking action oil oil and gas uh, for the core sector, for example, a lot of financial institutions, including in Europe, but also in 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 Canada, for example, have been excluding from their financial services companies based on the fact that they are developing projects that are inconsistent with the remaining carbon budget. So new coal plants or new coal mines that, that science have been saying um, inconsistent with the 1.5 targets for ages. So it's a time now to, to do the same for all fossil fuels and to actually condition the financial services of central banks to the stop in the development of new projects. And for that, we do have all the data needed to, to do it, uh, we just have to maybe ask the private banks uh, the same data, the same list uh, that they are using to implement their own policies. Great, thank you, Lucy. I'm going to turn now to some answer some questions from our audience. They've been pouring in thick and fast. Um, so this first one, I think I'll probably address to David. Um, it's from Lukash Krebel at the New Economics Foundation. Uh, Lukas says, uh, historically, central banks used to be more involved in actively steering credit away from undesirable activities and towards preferred sectors. Uh, given the scale of the challenge for a just and fast green transition and the lack of progress so far under market-led approaches, um, how do you see the role of more direct credit guiding policies going forward? Perhaps, David, you could talk us through some of the precise mechanisms that central banks could use to actively steer credit. Yeah, thanks very much, Katie, and thanks to, to Lukash for that question. Um, and, and Lukash is absolutely right that uh, credit guidance or direct credit allocation tools um, were relatively common in the sort of post-World War II era. Um, and, and, and there's, I mean, the term credit guidance can be actually, is quite a broad term. So it, it can actually encompass a whole range of, of the policies that we've just been uh, talking about. But then I think some, some policies that would really fall under this term of, of direct credit allocation uh, would be things like having a, a minimum quota for green investments or, or limits on, on, on dirty investment. Um, and, and also potentially uh, interest rate caps and floors um, for, for loans, depending on, on their, their, their destination. Um, and I think, you know, I think this question comes back to something else that was discussed earlier, which is, which is coordination with fiscal authorities to some extent. Um, and, and I think, I, I absolutely believe that, that direct credit allocation tools or credit guidance should be, should be used. But I, I think this really has to be uh, coordinated with fiscal authorities um, and, and that the period of credit guidance that we saw uh, post-World War II, that was, that did coincide with a period of much greater monetary fiscal coordination, uh, which actually worked very well. Um, so I, I think I, I would definitely like to see, and at Post of Money, we'd like to see uh, a revival of some um, transparent coordination uh, between monetary and fiscal authorities uh, and have a, a really harmonized approach to, to macroeconomic management rather than the kind of dislocated approach that we've been that we've seen in the past few decades. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. And um, we've got a, another question here from Hamish Stewart. Um, what do each of the speakers consider to be the single boldest possible move G20 central banks could make on climate change policy this year? Perhaps if we go around the panel on this one. Uh, Denai, would you like to start? Yes, thanks. Um, I think I brought up before the example of the Bank of England and the disclosure report that they published. I think that's a really important move uh, and it may not seem so in the headlines because yes it's a publication of a report and disclosure of how climate affects their different operations but actually when you talk to them and look at all the work that got into doing that I think it's really a very very bold exercise that a lot of central banks should copy 
Um, and so I will put that as a general one for all central banks. And then for central banks that have um, asset purchases, as asset purchase programs, I think really reviewing the assets that they hold and, the, and uh, they've recognized that there are climate risks that they are not taking account of. Um, I think recognizing that and acting on that would be a really bold move for the central banks to which this applies. Thanks, Dana. Just just pushing back on on your response there. When you say the disclosure report having a, a great impact, do you mean in terms of um, accelerating in institutional learning and capacity building within the bank? Because the Bank of England's disclosure report obviously also found that their their own monetary policy portfolio was aligned with a a three point five degree temperature increase which um, is obviously showing uh, that their current policy operations are to a certain extent embedding existing market failures, implying that further sort of action is needed. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's the first step to understanding what you're exposed to, what your impact is on climate, so the double materiality, and then it enables you to act. So I think it is a very, very bold first step because it also creates that kind of wake up um, uh, signal within the bank itself because you engage all your different departments. It's not just something that the NGFS team within the Bank of England had to look at. It's not something just that the supervisory team at the Bank of England, who in most central banks are the ones who kind of first engage with climate risk. It's, it was a move that meant that everyone across the bank had to look at how climate affects them. It had a lot of senior um, support and I think that that's why it's an exemplary initiative that other central banks should follow. But yes, you're absolutely right. It's uh, the the impact uh, was found to not be uh, uh, ideal, and I think that that is important in itself. That's great, thank you, uh, Lucy. What do you consider to be the single boldest move a central bank could make this year? For me to not buy any any assets from companies that are not pledging to stop developing new oil and gas projects. Um, maybe not stop uh, the purchase now, but maybe like in a few months after the COP at Glasgow, I think we are really underestimating uh, the scale of the urgency right now when we think about uh, the companies that are found in the ECB portfolio. We are thinking about Shell and Total and some, a lot of us are thinking, yeah, maybe they are not the worst, you know, uh, like they are doing, um, they are changing some investors thinking they might even take a radical shift because they are investing in renewable energy, but we need to remind that the capex are still massively um, uh, directed towards more fossil fuels. We, if we think about Total, Total plans to increase its fossil fuel production by 50% um, by 2030, which is in no way consistent with um, any um, serious climate scenario. So I think this is clearly where the actions needs to be on stopping uh, the expansion of fossil fuels and worsening uh, the, the climate situation. Because let's be clear, it's only stopping uh, the growth and it's not even uh, responding to the need to actually organize the closure of existing assets in a just uh, way for the workers and communities. Thank you. And Professor Yao Wang, what is your top policy? Excuse me, Kate? Yeah, sorry, <laughs> did we lose you there? Um, which do you consider to be the single boldest uh, policy that a central bank could take this year? The the uh, the single borders, sorry. Yes, yeah. uh, the next policy steps that um, the, the PBOC policy could take. Step okay. I think the next uh, policy step that uh, uh, well very soon they will uh, issue some uh, 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 green uh, uh, green uh, monetary policy to uh, to support just like green uh, green loan to commercial bank and a green rediscount for commercial bank. And this is on the way, on the process. Uh, I, I think we, we maybe we will see very, uh, uh, see this uh, 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 policy will issued very soon. And also uh, uh, we are discussing about to lower the uh, risk rate uh, for the uh, 
for the uh, risk rate for the uh, for the loan uh, for the green loan. If we can lower the green uh, the green uh, uh, the the risk risk rate for green loan, that will uh, you know it will improve the commercial bank's uh, green loan scare. So this is well very incentive is a bigger incentive for commercial banks. Thank you. I've got a question here, perhaps for David um, from Hillary Haynes, um, who asks, isn't there a massive contradiction between Brazil's central bank having progressive policies, but President Bolsonaro actively encouraging the burning and destruction of the Amazon forest for mining and agriculture? Yes, the, I mean, the, there is, um, I think, definitely a, a big tension there. Um, and, you know, I, I think I should I should really make it as clear as possible that, um, you know, this this ranking is by no means a, a comprehensive ranking of the environmental the status of all environmental policy in a country. It's really just looking at at what um, central banks and supervisors are doing um, in, in Brazil's case, um, you know, they they are in second place because they at the end of the day, they have taken concrete policy actions where others haven't. Um, so, you know, the central bank's first green policy was implemented back in 2008. So this, you know, a lot of these initiatives predate the, the Bolsonaro um, regime. And, and that first policy in 2008 did actually uh, produce a positive impact on deforestation rates at the time. There was a great climate policy initiative paper that showed this. Um, and the following year, a, a new piece of monetary legislation restricted financing for crop expansion in the Amazon and other environmentally sensitive re regions. Um, and there was a period of time where um, the deputy general manager of the BIS, uh, who was one of the co-authors of the Green Swan, uh, was actually deputy governor of the, the Brazilian Central Bank. And I assume um, he, he might have had a, a positive impact on green policies at the Brazilian Central Bank. And the latest major development, I think what, what is interesting here is to see that despite the, the Bolsonaro regime, um, I think that the Brazilian Central Bank does look like it's maintaining um, its commitment to green policies. Um, their latest announcement came in September 2020 uh, when they announced a, a sustainability pillar of their agenda BC. Uh, which includes commitments to a wide range of policies over the next few years, including the establishment of a green liquidity facility, a green bureau for rural credit, climate stress tests, and disclosure of, of uh, the central bank's own socio-environmental risks. Um, so I suspect that given the momentum that had already developed within the Brazilian central bank on this issue, um, I think I think we can expect that momentum to to continue. However, um, until you know the government and and fi Brazilian fiscal authorities uh, also play their part, um, I, I don't think we're going to see uh, significant progress on environmental issues in in Brazil. So I think that is a, a really important point, and it's um, it's definitely a, a serious tension, and and it would be interesting to see how how that plays out in the coming years. Thank you, David. I think that was a tricky question and you answered it very well. Um, I've got another question here um, from Stevie Downs, who uh, notes that uh, given the immensity of the challenges that will need to take place in the economy, including, for example, changes to work practices, transport, energy sources, um, how realistic is it to expect that this transition can take place whilst maintaining financial stability? Uh, so I wonder who wants to take that one on the idea of um, fast, fast materialising transition risks and what central banks can do. I can start on that. I think uh, there's definitely a trade-off uh, between the so-called physical risks and tackling the transition risks. So the faster you move to transition the economy, the more chaotic that will be. Um, and I think when you observe the language that central bankers use, when they make their speeches about climate change is very instructive because they talk sometimes about a war on climate change that is an existential crisis. And I think 
that sort of language implies that there will be um, casualties, there will be losers, it won't necessarily be a smooth transition, there will be bumps on the road. Of course, we want to minimize that. Uh, and that's why acting early is important. And um, in the trade-off between physical and transition risks, again, that's something that it's not just for the central banks to um, consider where the balance should be. Um, and the more orderly transitions you, you have, you may lead to the kind of hothouse scenario where you actually do not manage to um, contain physical risks to the same extent, but then if they do materialize, you still will get uh, financial stability impacts. So I think that balance needs to be uh, walked very carefully. And I think a lot of the analysis does focus on that, but it's a good question and it's not one that is easy to answer. I would, I would also add, add to that, that um, central banks and other policymakers obviously don't have to be sitting on the sidelines in a neutral capacity, you know, hoping that an orderly and smooth transition emerges without any input from them. And they can actually use their, their policy toolkit to actively support the, emergen the emergence of the sort of transition they want to see. And there was a, a very interesting uh, report released a couple of weeks ago by LSE and SOAS on net zero central banking. And the authors of that report argue that um, aligning central bank policy with government policy is actually the best way for central banks to minimise financial stability risks because they are using their policy toolkit in this active way to kind of shape the future that they want to see. Thank you for that. Um, so for my next question, it's a bit more of a, an out there one, but a forward thinking one. Uh, Rob B asks, can central bank digital currencies play any role in greening the financial system? If so, why? And what impact will digital assets have on the needed acceleration of green finance? I wonder if anyone wants to take that one. I'm happy to say a few words on that, Katie. Um, yeah, I think central bank digital currencies are are a really important development. I think that's another space that is really speeding up at the moment. And it is something that, that we've done a lot of work on at Positive Money. Um, our, our latest report on that was released last year. It was entitled Money We Trust. Um, and you know, we, we do think that having a, a, um, a public option, uh, a, a, digital, a public digital currency is, is a really, will be a really important development for um, our monetary system and, and for, uh, to some extent, a, a democratization of the monetary system. Um, I think it's, I mean, I think this is a question that would probably be better suited for my co-author who was uh, an author on the, the CBDC paper uh, we put out last year. But I, I essentially, I think that um, CBDCs could, I mean, I think they, they definitely would support um, a transition of the financial system, uh, potentially in a, a variety of ways. I think the clear mechanisms, I, I don't think uh, I'll get into right now. I think that's quite a, could be quite a technical discussion. And, and also, again, maybe slightly outside my, my own expertise. Um, but yeah, definitely an important question. And I would encourage checking out our, our report on that uh, money we trust. Thank you. And uh, my final question is going to just kind of lump together a lot of questions we've had on, on the concept of a, a just and, and social transition and what central banks can do to contribute to that. And um, I just sort of wanted to, to you know, open the issue um, where this, this risk-based approach, this market fixing approach that central banks, some central banks are preferring at the moment. Um, is there an argument that this approach could somehow undermine a green and just transition? Um, Yanis Dafermos, who's an economist at SOAS, has, has previously made the point that if you apply the same logic of managing your balance sheet for transition risks, if you apply that logic to physical risks as well, this would imply that a financial institution has to reduce its exposure to countries or regions of the world that will end up being highly exposed to climate change, which are of course disproportionately low and middle income countries. And this kind of has the dynamic of perversely decreasing access to finance precisely to those who may need it most to invest for adaptation and resilience. 
So my question is, you know, to what extent do we actually need to move towards a, a policy alignment approach in order to ensure that the green transition um, is not just about managing financial risk, but also ensuring we don't have unintended social consequences? Who wants to take that one on? Maybe I, I would just say, like, I, I will answer without answering the question, but there is a clear parallel with uh, the insurance sector where actually we can see already in the West Coast of the US, you would see a lot of insurers that are actually leaving, uh, considering the fires are as um, having like a huge impact on this view, uh, raising the cost of casualties every year. And we can see insurers leaving and refuse or either either increasing the, the cost of, of coverage for the retail market for the people leaving there or clearly leaving the, the, the space uh, which has become an insurable while at the same time they are still insuring companies that are fueling the climate crisis and I think uh, obviously the first answer of central banks should not to take their assets out of places where there is, there is like the uh, uh, where climate uh, risk happens uh, through the physical risk, but they, should, they really need to make sure that first they stop worsening the climate crisis directly through the monetary and prudential policy. So I would first say, before looking at uh, escaping and protecting yourself, you should have more this uh, direct of approach of making sure that you are actually not supporting um, the industry you, want, you stop fueling the climate crisis at the first place. Um, so it's not really answering your question of how we will make that happen at the end, but at least, I mean, from the start point, having, before having uh, to answer this question, there is another one which is more urgent to... to yeah, to and I can add to that as well, actually, about the, the capital market innovation that we can see there, because you see that with... Um, regions, as you said, California, but also it can be entire countries that are subject to losing access to market finance at the time when they need it the most, when they're hit by a natural disaster, for example. And we have seen innovation there. We've seen insurance linked securities, catastrophe bonds, and these are um, some new areas where we are trying to address this issue. Um, and it's a market that is still very small, but it is growing, and I think it can be one of the solutions to that. The IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has also started to do some climate assessments in the same way that they have the Article 4 assessments, where they look at the macro and fiscal outlook for different countries, to also look at how the, the exposure to climate risks is something that can be assessed in the same way. And there have been six pilot countries that they've done this for so far. So I think this helps kind of understand the exposure to sovereign risk um, that some countries may face because of being exposed to disasters and how that affects their, their access to finance. That's interesting. So some nascent financial markets, new instruments that could perhaps solve that problem. Um, I think the point I was perhaps opening up the discussion, we've now run out of time, <laughs> but that the, this kind of focus on risks alone um, almost has a bias to considering transition risks from a pure climate mitigation perspective, and it doesn't necessarily account for the need for climate adaptation as well, given the, the fact that many physical risks for climate change are now locked in, unfortunately. Um, well, I will have to draw our fascinating discussion to a close there. We've uh, covered a huge range of topics and um, it's been absolutely great to hear the diversity of perspectives and reaction to David and Positive Money's excellent report and also to hear some forward thinking ideas for the future, what we can hope to expect from central banks in the run up to the, uh, the COP26 uh, climate conference later this year. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the discussion today. I would like to give a very big thank you to all of our panellists for joining us. Um, please do uh, tweet about the event, um, share the recording round when it is finished. And um, yes, we hope to see you all again at uh, future events by Positive Money. So uh, I'll hand over to David just for some final words before we say bye. Oh, well, I just want to say thank you so much, Katie, and, and thank you uh, to all the panelists. I think this was a really great discussion. 
and and maybe just to finish off i think i'll also mention um in just a couple of weeks time there's actually another uh, report coming out uh, that i co-authored with uh, james vaccaro from the climate safe lending network and that that report is called financial stability in a planetary emergency um, and that will be published by UNEPFI on the 13th of April, and there will be a launch event on the 15th. Um, so I would definitely encourage you all to, to join that event as well um, and to check out that report, which does also have a little something to say about that last question uh, that was raised. But yeah, so thanks so much, Katie, and, and thanks to, to everybody that has joined today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everyone.